Hello, everyone. Welcome for the, to the first uh, seminar of this um, seminar series that Dimitri and I put together. And we, we will have seminars every, uh, uh, every, the, every second and fourth Wednesday of the, every month. And at the moment, we are covering all the, uh, all the weeks until more or less the end of uh, 2021. And um, and today the first uh, the first uh, guest is Peman Golshani. And before I introduce him, if Dimitri, you want to say something? Well, just to say that uh, this is very much Gabriele's initiative, and that he's done ninety five percent of the work, perhaps ninety nine percent of the work. Um, Please be uh, patient with us. This is our first attempt to run one of these uh, worldwide neuro seminar series. And so Payman's agreed to be the guinea pig. So we hope there won't be too many audiovisual problems. Uh, we don't actually know if we are talking to the whole world. Uh, there are 80 people uh, who, who are um, uh, coming up on our list of participants right now. Perhaps somebody could send us a message just to say that you can hear what we're saying. <laughs> someone please send us a message <laughs> is anyone there <laughs> all right so otherwise i'll hand back to gabriele who can introduce payment and then and then we'll we'll let payment give his talk ah yes some wonderful okay <laughs> thanks christina yeah and uh yeah the other things that i want to say that there is an ask ask a questions button on the on 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 the bottom of the page and you can ask questions there and the, you can also vote of the quest of which question you want to hear the answer from the questions that other people uh, write. So please use that. And if you need, if you want to do any questions before the end of the of the talk, uh, you can write directly in the chat here, not in the ask the questions. It will be more for the end of the talk. And if you want to ask some questions during the talk, you can write in the chat here. So. It's a pleasure for me to, to introduce Payman, and uh, I will do a brief biography, a brief uh, introduction. And so Payman obtained his BA in English and Molecular Cell Biology at the UC, UC Berkeley. And he then went on uh, to obtain his MD and PhD at the UC, uh, UC Irvine, Irvine, and where he studied the development of cortical thalamic function with um, Dr. Edward Jones. Then uh, he completed his uh, residency, in, uh, residency in neurology at uh, UCLA and completed also postdoctoral training with uh, Dr. Felix uh, Schweizer and Dr. Goping Fan. And uh, there he was studying the role of DNA methylation in cortical development. And uh, now is a faculty member of the UCLA where his lab studying how neuronal network dynamics drive cognition and how these coordinate activity patterns became altered by neurological diseases. And also his group, as many of you know, has also developed new open source tools for imaging neuronal activity patterns in freely behaving animals. And uh, to that, I can add that, for example, in his last paper, Tristan's papers uh, published in uh, Nature Neuroscience at the beginning of the year is the potential of these open source imaging tools uh, to study epileptogenesis, for example, has been brilliant in show. So, but I guess that we are going to hear a lot about it in, in, the, in the talk from Payment Darity. So, the title of the talk is Interneuron and Dis the, um, Desynchronization and Breakdown of Long Term Place Cell Stability in Temporal Lobe Epilepsy. And it's a pleasure for me again to introduce Payment. Thanks. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, let's see if the technology works. Uh, thank you so much uh, for for the invitation. Uh, uh, this is a real real pleasure to be here and to participate in this. Uh, I usually love uh, traveling places and presenting uh, our work, uh, but uh, this is this is also great. And I think 
it allows us to reach a lot of people that we normally wouldn't be able to reach. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about work uh, that was mainly done by Tristan Schumann, who's now uh, an assistant professor at Mount Sinai. Uh, this work was done in uh, collaboration with uh, Daniel Aroni, who's now an assistant professor at UCLA, um, and uh, Denise Kai, who's also at Mount Sinai as an assistant professor. Uh, Tristan led the work and Daniel uh, developed the miniature microscopes that I'm going to be talking uh, about. Uh, Daniel also analyzed all the data, uh, so I want to, to give them due credit before I, I start. Um, uh, the work uh, was done in collaboration with Alcina Silva and Baljeet Kak, who were uh, with, with, with me when we started the whole miniature microscope uh, initiative and uh, none of it would be possible without them. They're uh, very close colleagues. Also, um, uh, the silicon probe recordings were done in collaboration with Satiris Masmanidis uh, at UCLA. So I'm going to talk. Um, I'm just going to try to get rid of this one thing here. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, interneuron desynchronization and place cell instability in a model of temporal lobe epilepsy. That will be the like, basically three quarters of the talk. And then at the end, I'm going to just highlight some of the new technology we're developing uh, with miniaturized microscopy and that we're sharing uh, with the neuroscience community through miniscope.org. Uh, uh, technology drives science. And so I, I wanted to really highlight this work that is actually the work of many, many people, uh, including our NSF Center, um, and led by Daniel Aroni's group here at UCLA. So um, I'm a neurologist. I see, uh, I mainly see epilepsy patients actually in the clinic at the veteran, Veterans Hospital. Uh, temporal lobe epilepsy is extremely common in the veteran population and in the general population. Uh, it, it's a frequent uh, sequelae of head trauma. Uh, you, you can have head trauma um, and develop temporal lobe epilepsy many years after. There's a big latent period afterwards. Um, other risk factors include infections of the brain, uh, prolonged seizures uh, as a child. Um, uh, but also there, there may be, sometimes we don't know why some develop um, it is one of the most frequent forms of epilepsy in adults. Uh, patients can have what we used to call complex partial seizures, uh, but now we call focal discognitive seizures. In epilepsy, we're very good at renaming things. Um, uh, and uh, patients can also have generalized tonic-clonic seizures. For those of you who've never seen uh, complex partial seizure uh, patients, frequently stare ahead. They lose contact with their environment. Uh, it may be, the seizure may be very bland. They may just be staring ahead. Uh, some of them may, may start having automatisms. Uh, they can smack their lips, start chewing and picking at, their, uh, picking at their clothes. Some of them may wander around sort of like a little bit zombie-like. Uh, these seizures can end uh, or they can evolve sometimes into generalized tonic-clonic seizures. As we see in the clinic, these seizures are pretty hard to treat. Uh, um, in some, a, a lot of patients respond, but uh, a, freak, a, a significant fraction of patients don't really respond to medications. We, we add one medication, we add another, we try three medications together. Uh, the, there's a push to push these patients into uh, getting epilepsy surgery, and uh, many, many patients respond to this. Um, uh, however, uh, there um, uh, a lot of patients have significant cognitive disability outside of their seizures. There's, there are many comorbidities that have been recognized that are associated with temporal of epilepsy. Uh, one is depression and cognitive disabilities. Another, uh, a lot of these patients have uh, great trouble with their memory and it interferes with their work. And so uh, one of the major pushes here is to understand the sources of this cognitive disability and try to find treatments for it. 
if you were to do an MRI on a patient uh, with temporal lobe epilepsy, very frequently what you find is uh, hippocampal sclerosis. Uh, on an MRI, uh, this is a T2 scan. Um, the hippocampus uh, on one side is typically smaller and bright on uh, T2 studies. Uh, it's this is a pretty obvious example of it. Um, uh, if you find this, and if you do epilepsy monitoring uh, and see that the seizures are coming from that side, this this patient would be um, would be a very good candidate for epilepsy surgery. If you take that hippocampus, which is sclerotic, and actually uh, do histology, you would find many findings that have been replicated over the years. Uh, one is interneuron uh, cell death, not only interneuron death, but also excitatory neuron death uh, in many hippocampal subfields, uh, including CA1 and CA3. There's, there's some loss of interneurons, particularly somatostatin positive ones, uh, mainly in the dentate hilus, but also uh, in other subfields. There's loss of PV positive cells, um, and there's also a great deal of network or reorganization that has been uh, discovered in humans and other other animals, um, animal models. Uh, for example, there's mossy fibers sprouting where the dentate granule cells sprout connections and innervate each other. These are recurrent connections which didn't exist before, and many people think that this this plays a role in hippocampal dysfunction and possibly epileptogenesis. Um, there are other uh, there are other examples of network reorganization, which includes sprouting uh, of the somatostatin cells from CA1 down into the dentate gyrus, uh, which is um, uh, not seen in, in normal animals. These 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 changes, the cell loss and the network reorganization, and also ch uh, other changes, including changes in ion channels and plasticity issues uh, lead to spontaneous seizures and cognitive deficits. But it's still not very clear what, what are the neural dynamics that underlie the, these deficits, these cognitive deficits. So uh, there's been uh, a lot of work by Greg Holmes's group and colleagues, uh, Lang Santini and others, that have studied epilepsy and have found uh, deficits in place cells. Um, and our work extends that work uh, where we look at uh, this still across long time periods, uh, and uh, looks and also looks at the evolution of this place cell dysfunction after epileptogenesis. Um, as uh, hippocampal interneurons are have been implicated in epileptogenesis and in hippocampal dysfunction in epilepsy, we uh, asked whether hippocampal GABAergic interneurons change their phase lock firing patterns and synchronization in epilepsy in a TLE model mice, the pilocarpine model. We also ask how this, uh, we ask how this impacts the precision and stability of place cell firing in CA1 excitatory neurons. And uh, finally, uh, we ask if there's a latent period for the emergence of this, these dynamic changes or whether they arise uh, immediately after. And uh, uh, I'm going to address all of these questions um, uh, with this work. So uh, I mentioned that a lot of patients with temporal lobe epilepsy have cognitive deficits. Uh, if we model uh, temporal lobe epilepsy in animals, the way we do it is we inject animals, uh, normal wild type mice, C57 black 6 mice with pilocarpine, which is a cholinergic agonist, uh, these mice uh, undergo uh, status epilepticus after injection. So they have a two hour long seizure and uh, we stop the seizure uh, with, with diazepam. Um, uh, after this point, uh, uh, the animals recover and uh, over the next few weeks start developing uh, seizures which become more and more frequent. Uh, we, uh, we and others have, have, have shown that these animals have um, very significant uh, hippocampal dependent memory dysfunction. Uh, this is the Morris water maze where an animal is released into a, a tank and finds a hidden platform and then later is given a probe trial 
after the memory is supposed to have been formed and the animals that have formed the memory actually hang out in the in the quadrant where the platform used to be uh normal animals controls uh, uh spend about 40 percent of the, the their time there a lot more than in the other quadrants but the epileptic animals basically uh, form very almost no memory i would say no memory of where the platform is across learning they can do the visible platform test just fine meaning that their visual function is normal another test of hippocampal function is this Q delayed alternation TMAs, uh, a test of hippocampal dependent working memory. Um, this task becomes hippocampal dependent when you keep the animal uh, between uh, the Q phase and the test phase in a little chamber for 15 seconds. Essentially, they have to remember where they got the reward in the first phase and then go to the opposite direction when they're given a choice. Uh, the the pilocarpine animals, uh, are basically performed very near chance, whereas the, the, the controls have formed a memory and are performing at about 80% correct. So basically, in summary, these animals have, have pretty significant uh, hippocampal dependent behavioral dysfunction. Um, and we wanted to understand the neural dynamics that underlay that. Uh, we first started uh, using um, uh, a head fix preparation in virtual reality. Here an animal is head fixed and it runs up and down. Here I'm showing that it's running up and down a T maze, but in actuality, when we tested the animals, they were just running up and down a linear track. Uh, the, the reason for this was uh, not so much about finding what virtual reality is doing, but it, it was an easy shortcut for us to record in freely behaving animals as, as when we started, we had, we were. Uh, had no experience in that. So the animals are on this ball, they're head fixed, and they run up and down a virtual track. We can put in silicon probes that were developed by uh, Satiris Masmanidis. These recordings are pretty straightforward to do in head fixed animals. And as the animals run back and forth, uh, the, the silicon probes inserted, it, it extends all the way from CA1 down into the dentate gyrus, into the hylus. And uh, we can record both local field potentials and uh, and action potential firing. Uh, so uh, what we replicate one of the major findings that have been found in the pilocarpine models of epilepsy and other epilepsy models is that the power is greatly diminished uh, all throughout, but you know, with theta is maximal in the lepinosa molecular era, and that's where it was diminished the most. So that, that replicates other findings. We also found that the coherence of theta between uh, uh, the hylus and the orions uh, was was greatly diminished. So there was there appeared to be some uh, some desynchronization between the hippocampus uh, between different subfields of the hippocampus CA1 and dentate gyrus. We also found a lot of other findings, including gamma rhythm abnormalities um, that I won't talk to you about. But there were uh, there were definitely deficits in, in gamma rhythms as well, uh, or changes in gamma rhythms. Uh, so uh, we can record local field potentials, but we can also perform, we can record action potentials. Uh, what we were interested in was to, to determine how these interneurons that we record, we can identify interneurons by their spike shapes and their firing rates. They typically fire at high rates and their action potentials are narrow. Now, we can't identify specific inner neuron types that would require uh, labeling of the cells, um, which we've done in the past, but it's highly labor intensive. You have one cell per animal. So here we recorded sort of all the inner neurons in CA1 and dentate gyrus and looked to see how these cells fired uh, in, in phase with different oscillations, the theta oscillation. Uh, what we find is that in CA1, uh, the magnitude of phase locking or the R value, the, the modulation index, was diminished in epileptic animals, as you would expect with the theta oscillation power also being diminished. Uh, but um, when we looked at the dentate gyrus interneurons and see, saw how they fired, uh, they were the phase that they, these interneurons like to fire with respect to the CA1 
theta rhythm was dramatically altered in controls, as you can see in the lower left corner, most of the cells like the fire in the falling phase and trough of theta, whereas in the epileptic animals, this, this order was, was greatly uh, disturbed. So you can have, now we had cells firing at all phases of theta, and, um, and even though their modulation to the particular theta cycles was, was not changed. So basically, you have cells now firing at all phases of theta, and therefore, the, the coordination or the synchronization between the dentate and the CA1 interneurons uh, became altered and diminished. So here we have a sort of a failure to synchronize between different hippocampal subregions. We wondered how this could impact the coding of information by the hippocampus. Um, this, is, uh, this is a slide. Um, um, to remind me to talk about our miniaturized microscopes um, uh, to, to look at hippocampal place cell function we used uh, uh, miniaturized microscopes these microscopes are developed by Mark Schnitzer's lab um, uh, many years ago uh, and they were commercialized uh, uh, they were very expensive and so our group really spearheaded an effort to make these microscopes open source um uh this this was our first version of our miniaturized microscope so if you're interested in how these things work uh they essentially take the large wide field fluorescence microscopes that you may have in your lab and have shrunk them down so instead of a big objective lens you have a uh very small cylindrical grin lens instead of a big big camera scientific CMOS camera, you have a little uh, CMOS sensor that's like essentially a cell phone camera. Um, so uh, Daniel Aroni designed uh, this microscope uh, and we've uh, since open sourced it. It's been, it's, it's now being used by um, well over 500 labs and several thousand groups have actually logged on to this, our website where we shared this our microscopes cost a uh, hundredfold less. So for about $1,000, you could build our microscopes and anyone can use it. Um, uh, they, essentially, uh, you can really image any place in the brain that you would like as long as you can put the lens fairly close to uh, the cells you're imaging. 200 microns. Um, uh, we've been able to image CA1, parietal cortex, uh, subiculum. Um, this, the dorsal striatum is very straightforward. We're now uh, putting thin grin lenses into nucleus accumbens and imaging them. And other people have done other brain regions. We've had some trouble with the thalamus, but that was, that's been the only region. Uh, it seems like it works. One thing you have to consider, though, is that by to image these areas, we have to remove the overlying cortical regions. Uh, or overlying brain region. So that's one caveat that you have to be aware of when you um, when you do these experiments. Um, am I still sharing my screen? Yeah, but it's all black at the moment. Oh, let me see. I tried to hide that uh, <laughs> that message. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to try to unshare a reshare again, probably it's faster. I think I know what to do. Am I back? Yes. OK, terrific. All right. Um, so essentially, we can do these recordings in really any brain region. We decided to use this in the pilot carping model of epilepsy and to um, uh, implant these miniaturized microscopes uh, after the animals had uh, developed epilepsy. So essentially, the animals would undergo status epilepticus and recover. Uh, they would be video monitored to make sure they had epilepsy, then they would be implanted with grin lenses. 
uh, and injected with GCAM 6F um, AAV virus into the dorsal hippocampus. It'd be water restricted just so to, to motivate them to run up and down a linear track. And then they would be imaged while they ran on this track uh, back and forth uh, over a period of nine days, so five sessions. So we can image the same exact cells across these nine sessions and evaluate the stability of uh, the place cells. Uh, what we used for this, uh, this particular experiment was the wireless uh, or the wire-free scopes that Daniel Aroni uh, developed and uh, optimized. Uh, uh, we call it wire-free rather than wireless because they, um, even though it says wireless here, uh, because they're, they're essentially data logging microscopes um, there's no wire connecting the animal to the uh, data acquisition device. The, all the videos are recorded on a micro SD card that fits on the head of the animal. And, um, and the, the microscope is battery powered. So you can essentially get about 20 minutes of recording with this microscope. There's no wires attaching it. So the behavior is much more naturalistic. We can go longer uh, if need be. Um, if um, we use a larger battery. However, the microscope gets too heavy for, for mice. If you have bigger animals, you can certainly record for longer because these micro SD cards have enormous capacity. We could record for far longer periods. We are, uh, or I say we, meaning Daniel's lab is actively developing wireless microscopes that transmit the information currently, but those aren't ready yet. So this is an example of what the wire-free microscope looks like. There's no wire. The animals can do behavior uh, without any um, hindrances. Uh, we we know that this this really does impact behavior and makes social behavior much more natural. Uh, it also allows animals to do tasks they would be very difficult for them to do. For example, running up and down this 25-foot uh, long track. Like I used feet instead of meters because the talk was hosted by uh, by the English. No, I'm, uh, that's the joke. Um, it's a seven and a half meter track, uh, which is incidentally the length of our lab. And it requires actually two cameras to know exactly where the mouse is since the track is so long. But it's a wire-free microscope and the animals can run back and forth without any hindrances. We can record in the hippocampus and we can actually record readily record uh, place cell firing. You, here you can see in overlay and also in sort of real time what the, what the place cell function is doing. Uh, cells are firing sequentially as animals are going up and down this long track. If you actually look at the uh, activity on this particular long track, the activity is much more um, much more nuanced than what you'd find when the animal runs on much shorter tracks. There are cells, for example, which fire the entire duration of one direction. Um, and then there are also cells which fire sort of in multiple locations there. Uh, and this has been shown before uh, by other researchers, but it's, it's really, you can see the, the diversity of the population. Uh, we can also use decoding techniques, as I'll show you later, to, uh, to basically, since we know where each cell is firing, by using the population activity patterns, we can decode, basically read the mind of the animal and predict where it is in space. And so the decoders do a pretty good job. They sometimes jump, jump a bit back and forth, but, um, but they're, they're actually predicting the direction of travel and the location of the animals very nicely. This is a Bayesian decoder that I'll talk about and applying it. So, this allows us, one, to look to see how well the population is encoding the, the location of the animal and the direction of travel. And if you, if you train a decoder on one day and test it on another day, you can actually use it to quantify the stability of representations. Because if your representation is rock solid across multiple days, then you should be have no trouble decoding the activity of one day with the cells recorded on, on different days. When we look at the place cells in uh, pilo, which is the epileptic animals and control animals, we can see that uh, even the best place fields in the pilo animals are broader 
and they're much less stable even within uh, single sessions each. So you can see each line is one cell. Uh, these cells are, are usually directionally selective. You can see in the controls, uh, each trial is one line of the white. And the animals here, for example, the place cells fire pretty reliably in one location, in one direction as the animals run. The pilo animals, these place fields are much, much broader and they sometimes fire, they sometimes don't, and they frequently remap even within single sessions. The red cells are place cells and the green cells are the non-place cells. And, and we can see that the proportion of place cells as defined by their stability, which is how, how well they maintain their firing within one location and their information content which is how precisely they fire uh, in one specific location, how well you can predict where the animal is based on the firing of that one cell. Um, the, it's, it's, uh, the, the proportion of place cells is far, far lower in the epileptic animals. Uh, this you can quantify by, again, by a stability score and by information content. And you can see both information content and stability are lower in the epileptic animals, they both fall. And this, this basically makes it so that fewer, far fewer cells are place cells, which are in red. And even the non-place cells, their coding is, is altered as well. Their stability and information content is lower. You can plot these, uh, and as you can see, these cells, they're firing tiles the entire linear track. Um, and, uh, uh, just one thing I should say is that the, uh, we didn't test these animals on the very long track. These, this is actually a two meter track rather than a seven and a half meter track. Uh, but uh, they're, they're, um, uh, you can clearly see that the place, even the best place cells in the pilo animals are somewhat uh, fuzzier, broader, and there's fewer of them in the epileptic. So now, uh, the, one of the great things about uh, in vivo calcium imaging is that you can actually match up cells across uh, single sessions and across days. Uh, we can do this fairly confidently. Uh, and if you can, you can record where the place field is for, let's say, in the controls, you can see that these cells, we, and we can order the cells based on where they fire. And so um, you would see this line go across. First, they fire on one direction, then another and they're pretty specific. Now, if you record the cells again in half an hour, and now you don't order the line about where the, where the peak firing was, but there's clearly stability in the place fields, even half an hour at half an hour in the controls, uh, the cells are pretty much firing where they used to. There's a little bit of jitter, but the information is still there. If you do that in the pilo, uh, even at half an hour, you can see that that uh, that a lot of the the cells are the jitter seems to be greater. They seem there seems to be more remapping as to where these cells are firing. We can do this at 30 minutes, but also at six hours, you can see that this stability. If if everything was stable, you should see exactly what you see uh, in in the initial uh, example on the left on the right. But that's not what you see. You see it's becoming far fuzzier in the epileptics. And by the time you get to one day, uh, two days, and then by seven days, it's essentially gone. But there's clearly still a trace of this in, in the control animal. There's some stability of the place cells over multiple days. So the long-term stability of these place cells is dramatically lower. Um, and the precision of firing is lower. This is true for if even if, when, if you pick cells that are, uh, that have, significant place cell firing and stability even across a single session, they, they still significantly remap in the epileptic animals. Uh, we quantified all this, and as you can clearly see, the, the stability is lower at 30 minutes, six hours, and across to seven days in the epileptics. So another way to look at this is by looking at a decoder, uh, sort of similar to what I showed you before. White is the position of the animal, and the red and green are the, the decoder. If it's green, it's predicting the animal is moving in one direction. And if it's red, the animal is moving in another direction. You can see on the left in the control, 
The decoder does a pretty good job predicting where the animal is. Sometimes it jumps around. Very rarely it makes a mistake about the direction that the animal is running. Uh, but when you look at the pilo animal, it's a, a real mess. Red and green are mixed up. The, the decoder is jumping all over the place. And this is because direction um, and location of the animal are not encoded well in the population. And the decoding error is far greater in, uh, in the epileptics than in the controls, both direction and position. So what happens? So you can take this, do the same thing. You can use the decoder across days and see how well uh, the decoder does. Um, and it, uh, and again, it does far, far more poorly in um, in the epileptic animals than in the controls. Uh, and the decoding error is far, far larger um, in the epileptic animals. Uh, so these are experiments these this 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 paper took many many years and uh tristan had his own lab by the time we got to this section um partly at the request of the reviewers who did this experiment but this was a brilliant experiment that tristan did in his own lab um and uh what what we what we were wondering here is whether this dysfunction that we're seeing the instability and the imprecision of the place fields whether they're present immediately after epileptogenesis. And by immediately here, we're I'm talking about within three weeks, uh, two to three weeks after epileptogenesis, uh, or whether you know it takes longer. Uh, and may maybe this is a process that's sort of slowly developing throughout, uh, and it takes some time. And so here, uh, he tracked the, uh, the number of seizures that were uh, animals were having. Even at two weeks, the animals are having a seizure every two days or so, but this number becomes more and more. And by six weeks, the animals are having a, almost a seizure a day. Uh, he did this with epilepsy monitoring. But uh, if you actually look at the, the stability of these place cells, at three to four weeks and almost at five, the stability of the place cells is actually the same uh, among in between the epileptics and the controls. It's only after the sixth, seventh, and eighth, during the sixth, seventh, and eighth weeks where the stability is far lower and the decoding, um, the, the decoding error is far greater in these animals. So there's something that's happening uh, between three and six weeks where basically the hippocampal function so this view and gives us an opportunity to look at the processes that are involved here because it's not an immediate result of the damage it's taking some time to develop and so um my lab studying this um this is unpublished work but we're, we're trying to look at the transcriptomic changes that happen between three and six weeks and it's work in progress using single cell rna seq and this is work led by victoria ho who's a neurology fellow working in the lab. And um, uh, I think this, this could shed some light on what changes are occurring in the hippocampus um, during this time. Uh, so this, um, so what are the causes of this instability and in place cell dysfunction? We collaborated with the Europa Rossi's lab uh, with Spiridon Chavlis, who was, uh, postdoc there and IOTA, uh, and they, they're excellent uh, computational neuroscientists. They created a model uh, of CA1 and place cell firing within CA1. This model actually is fairly elaborate and had multiple different kinds of interneurons uh, that were uh, included in it. Um, and and this, this model generates place cell related activity. Um, uh, and so what, what we asked was, you know, what, what's the reason that the place cell dysfunction occurs here? We know there's some interneuron loss within uh, CA1. It's, it's not a huge number, and it can be variable between animals. But uh, could it be that just these animals, they don't have as many interneurons and that this is causing the place cell dysfunction? And so when, when uh, 
you have to have computationally reduced the number of SOM cells or PV cells. Uh, uh, the, there was really very little change in the percentage of place cells or stability or information content. I mean, 25% is typically what people have seen in the literature. Uh, we even see less than that. So it's unlikely that it's the interneuron loss that's causing this. If you go ahead and decrease the, the numbers even further to, to portions that we don't see, uh, it, takes, it takes quite a bit of reduction to induce changes in the information content or the precision. But again, we don't see a change in stability even if we get rid of all the somatostatin cells. If you reduce the PV cells, you get the cells, the, the place cells obviously become a lot more imprecise, but at very high numbers of reduction. But stability doesn't decrease, and it actually increases a little bit in the model. So it didn't seem that it was the, uh, it was the loss of place cells. However, if you desynchronize uh, the various inputs that are coming into the hippocampus, this desynchronization, sort of what we're seeing with the interneurons, desynchronization can dramatically reduce stability and um, uh, and and uh, the information content of the cells. So this is a hint that it's not just loss of cells, but it's actually more their dysfunction. Uh, another proof of this, uh, again inspired by reviewers, was. Uh, we tried to do some causal experiments and use inhibitory dreads uh, in CA1. Uh, inhibitory dreads worked in slices. We could inhibit, uh, we could decrease the excitability of SOM cells or PV cells using SOM CRE or PV CRE animals in slices. Uh, when we tried to look to see if place cell, so the hypothesis is that it's really not the place, it's really not the loss of SOM or PV cells. And, and, and in fact, we didn't see any change in the information content or stability of the place cells in vivo when we gave CNO and, and, in, in, and decreased the excitability of SOM or PV cells. Uh, the dreads seem to be working as we did see some increased activity in the PV cell population, in the PV reduction population. So it, it, it was doing something, but it didn't alter the stability or the information content. Um, so this is again more evidence that it's not necessarily just loss of cells, but it's um, it's a change uh, in the whole synchronization of the hippocampus. So to conclude this part, uh, I just kind of recap some findings that we have uh, far fewer CA1 place cells in pyelomice in the epileptic animals. The place fields are less stable. The, the increased information in content conditions degraded. And, uh, and we see this emerge within, after three weeks of, uh, uh, between three and six weeks after epileptogenesis. And this may be uh, one of the reasons why spatial cognition and cognition in general is poor, uh, memory is so poor in individuals with temporal lobe epilepsy. So uh, this is the first part, but I wanted to give people a, a taste of what um, uh, of the new open source miniaturized microscopy tools that the NSF Neuronext Center that we're directing uh, is developing, um, and uh, these tools are all will be open source if they're not already. Uh, the wire free scope is open source, um, and uh, and we hope that other people use these tools as they need them. Uh, this is all developed by Daniel Aroni's lab, and it's his engineering. Uh, we've been testing these microscopes in our labs, um, and so uh, we're, we're very much uh, excited with the new development, his new developments. This is uh, the new version of the microscope. It's now uh, being offered by the Open EFIS production facility uh, in the Champalimo. Um, they're putting these microscopes together and sending them to people or sending people kits. Uh, it's a far better miniscope than the first version. We call, call it the V4. Uh, focusing is, can be done electronically. The sensor is far better. We can actually record now for hours uh, and not bleach. Uh, there's position sensors on the microscope, and it's totally 
redesigned. The field of view is much larger, uh, over a millimeter. Uh, we've been able to uh, make our microscopes uh, waterproof and test them in the in, in the Morris water maze. This is actually uh, Denise's idea how to get these animals to swim with these microscopes. This is actually a wire-free microscope, but the animal uh, they don't swim well if if you don't uh, if you don't use this little trick. The, the animal is actually connected to a helium balloon, and uh, you have to make sure that the balloon is is not overly inflated because the results could be catastrophic lose your animal um one thing i've learned is that jokes you get zero input on zoom so you, you don't know if people are laughing um but the, 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 that was a true experiment that we were actually doing in collaboration with michelle michelle basso and daniel's building these mini these miniaturized microscopes for non-human primates they actually work for rats and tad blair's lab is actually using them, the, the field of view is enormous, it's three by three millimeters. So if we can get them to work in the primate, we could image thousands of neurons simultaneously. Um, you can see the difference in the size of the fields of view. This is the V3, the V4, and then the whole, the whole region could be captured with the new, we call it the Thimini scope, which is the, the, the monkey scope. This is the, the entire field of view imaging a, a section, a slice. Um, so you have cellular resolution across very wide regions. We're testing these with various apparatuses on for non-human primates. Uh, we've also developed an e-scope. Uh, the e-scope is an integrated miniscope with multi-channel electrophysiology. So you could essentially do a 32-channel electrophysiology, extracellular recordings with, let's say, a silicon probe or with tetrodes um, at the same time as we do mini scope recordings. And all the data is acquired uh, and multiplexed together with the imaging data so that all the data is sent out over a single coaxial wire. Uh, and that, that's useful if you want to be able to record electrophysiological signals at the same time as your calcium signals. Here, for example, Pad Blair's lab is looking at theta oscillations and calcium imaging in the rat CA1. Uh, and we've done some experiments where we've looked at ripple oscillations on one, hip, one hippocampus and calcium imaging on, on another hip, of the contralateral hippocampus and have found cells which, whose firing is you know, reliably modulated by the ripples. This is an example of four cells Who's, who had a calcium signal that was that was synchronized to the ripples, and so we we'd like to look at reactivation or replay. One of the main NSF center is to get real time analysis working, and Tad Blair, Jason Kong, and Jay Chen are building new FPGA devices. Well, typically when we analyze our data, it can take us days many, many days to analyze data. We'd like to analyze data not in days, but in, in you know, milliseconds, and so that we can feed back. And this, we already built these devices that feed back ex extremely rapidly. So you could sense the activity, let's say, if you're interested in the activity of certain cells, you can, you can trigger off their activation. People are doing this with two photon microscopy, but here we're doing, you know, FPGA-based motion correction at the same time, uh, and and Tad has shown that he can, in real time, decode where the animal is in space. Uh, in collaboration with Ali Pasha Vaziri's lab, the NSF Center has built these. Um, well, the Vaziri lab has built these uh, light field miniaturized microscopes. Uh, a micro lens array is put in front of the the sensor, and uh, this basically um, allows you to gain information about where, what depth the light, the fluorescence light is coming. With typical one photon miniaturized microscopy, you get sort of a, your, your Z resolution is very, very poor, and you don't really know where the cells are, whether they're on one layer or another. And this, this technique allows you to, to sort of get very accurate depth information and Ali Pasha's lab was able to reconstruct the depth position of cells in CA1. And so this would be very useful 
uh, as for example, in CA1, the superficial and deep cells do different things. They're transcriptomically different. Uh, they, they have different functional properties. So this would be a cool tool to use with that. And that this is under development for release. And finally, uh, my lab uh, in collaboration with Matt Strawman at UCSD and Daniel Aroni and a grad student, Blake Madrugas, we're building uh, two photon miniaturized microscopes um, that have really excellent X, Y, and Z resolution, spatial resolution. Uh, the versions uh, that have been published so far, the field of view is fairly small. We're trying to expand our field of view to uh, over six, 700 microns so that this would look just like a tabletop uh, two photon microscope. And uh, we've, we use these MEMS mirrors to steer the, the beam. And uh, we've been able to image slices and macrophages in vivo on the surface of the brain. So um, the macrophages were, uh, were an accidental discovery. Um, we were trying to image astrocytes, and we ended up with macrophages. Uh, this was done in collaboration with Balji Coxlap. Um, so the microscopes are working, and we're trying to optimize them so, so that we could open source these microscopes as well. And finally, I'll give a plug for miniscope.org. Uh, really, uh, there's a lot of members all over the world, um, even in Siberia. Uh, but uh, over 2,000 members, there's uh, we post everything there, including how to build the microscopes, how to troubleshoot building them, and uh, people post improvements they've made to the microscopes. We've had multiple workshops where we've discussed um, how to use the microscopes, and we're at SFN. We typically have a a workshop on 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 the mini scopes as well. And as new new improvements are made, we'll we'll include those as well. So. I wanted to thank everybody. Uh, this is the lab before the pandemic. Uh, come to LA, life is really good here. All we have is earthquakes and now we have coronavirus, but that's about it. Uh, so um, this is actually a somewhat older picture, um, but nothing changes. Uh, again, I wanted to acknowledge everyone who helped with these experiments. Uh, I've, I've acknowledged them as I've gone on, but I uh, wanted to especially uh, acknowledge our funding sources, including the NSF, the NIH Brain Initiative, uh, now uh, uh, the VA and various other funding sources. Without, without it, none of this would be possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really fantastic. Um, so what we thought we'd do is I'll just ask you a question and Gabriel will police the, the um, question and answer forum. So if people st could start ask, lining up their questions in the, in the question box, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, if you haven't found it, it says ask a question, click on that and it comes up. Uh, so Payman, that's a really fantastic talk. Um, if we can go back to the first half, um, the, the place cell instability and um, and you were monitoring the seizure frequency presumably by video, and that's and you were getting, on average, fewer than one seizure a day. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So, in the first part of the experiments, uh, we didn't do EEG monitoring. We just did video monitoring, and uh, we would film the animals and uh, and yeah. monitor whether they had obvious generalized monitoring. Product. In the second part. Uh, Tristan actually did do EEG monitoring, and those uh, those seizures were actually recorded with video EEG. Yeah, and initially there aren't that many seizures, but the number of seizures increase as the animals go on. Yeah, right. Because something we found, and and a couple of other laboratories have seen this as well. Although with the Knate model, the hippocampal Knate model, rather than the intraperitoneal pilocarpine model, is that we only pick up, you know, a very small number of seizures using a cortical electrode, and these are these are the seizures that generalize. 
Uh, but if we have an electrode right in the hippocampus, we're seeing a very high frequency of very short-lasting seizures lasting five to ten seconds, happening up to once every few minutes. Uh, and so I'm just wondering if you've ever seen anything like that, either with your uh, with your with your um, miniscope, or, or whether there's any other suggestion that that this may be corrupting the the place cells. I mean, obviously it depends on the first the first observation, can you actually detect something like that using miniscope? Well, we can certainly detect seizures with the miniscopes. We do, we do see them. We actually do, to get our, if the animals had a seizure, either a generalized one or one that you could only see with the miniscopes. Um, uh, I think we did have some examples where the seizures were pretty bland and you could only see them sort of by miniscope. So I think we try to exclude those those portions. Uh, hmm. But you're right. I mean, the question is, what is actually creating this place cell instability? Is it that every time the animal has a seizure, you essentially wipe the slate clean and have to reform these place fields? That's possible. I mean, there's, there's, Jeff McGee has shown that you, you get these place fields forming when you have dendritic spikes, and you have plenty of those, I think, during a seizure. So. Um, is it possible that that explains the instability, uh, or is it some other process? Um, I can tell you that these animals behave a lot like if it can't, it, like entorhinal cortex lesioned animals, and we know that in this model and in humans, the entorhinal cortex is severely affected. Tristan's lab is studying the role of the entorhinal cortex in this place field instability. So, um, yeah, but the, the question being is there, are there seizures that are more subtle? I'd say yes. And uh, and um, what role could they be playing? I mean, interictal spikes could be playing a role, and we have lots of those. Uh, we haven't quantified that effect. Okay. So, Gabriel, you, you, you're you're looking at the uh, the top yeah. voted questions. I'll let you take over. Yeah, and I saw that Hitan has two questions. So, if it's fine with you, I can we can try to invite him on screen so he can ask all the questions in once. If you can uh, unshare your screen, uh, Dayan. Dayman. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I can do that. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I try to invite him uh, to ask both of the questions in once that uh, should be easier, and we see if he's accepting the invitation. Actually, yes, it's connecting. I think it is easier because there were two long questions. So, <laughs> in the meantime, there was also another question that was, "How did you selectively record interneurons?" From ammo. How do we record interneurons? How selectively you record interneurons? Well, we the recording the electrophysiological recordings uh, were based on spike shape and firing rate, and so they're fairly fairly clear. The the firing rates are high. They they have phase lock firing to theta oscillations, and then you know they they can fire up to we use pretty traditional metrics. We don't know what kind of interneurons they are, uh, but uh, they're certainly hippocampal interneurons. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ethan, to accept my invitation on that there was not planned. Oh, oh yeah, I was, I was surprised. I haven't put on my makeup yet. <laughs> um, if you want to be on this. Two questions, so I I'm not ready to be on worldwide neuro. Uh, so, Payman, awesome talk. That's really spectacular. It just gets more and more impressive each time I hear an update about it. So just a couple questions. Um, have you ever um, been able to uh, image before and after epilepsy induction? Is that possible? The same neurons or the same brain area? Well, we, we haven't done it. We proposed doing it, but we haven't done it yet. It's, uh, okay. it, it's challenging. I mean, the pilot yeah. has a mortality rate. Uh, and uh, and whether you can track the same cells before and after is something that you have to work out. 
because uh, there's a lot of changes. Um, so but I think it's possible if, if you if you implant a lot of animals and 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 try whether you're exactly looking at the same cells is another issue. Right. I mean, may, yeah, you'd have to maybe label them sparsely so that you could align them before and after or something like that. Yeah, I've done a little of that. So I know it's kind of what goes in the front end, only a tiny percentage comes out the other end. So it'd be really painful to lose implanted animals that would invariably die or yeah, maybe it surely would. Not have, yeah. or, or that didn't become chronically epileptic or whatever. So my other question is related to um, comparing uh, um, place cells and control versus epileptic animals and uh, sort of detecting active cells. So um, can, can you explain how you um, validated that you're sort of detecting cells in the same way? Uh, so for example, like with the calcium indicators, um, if let's say cellular activity changes or there's a change in bursting, uh, if you're saying that X percentage of cells are place cells, um, that sort of of the cells that you're able to detect with the technique, right? But if cells yeah, are I mean, firing at low rates or or let's say even single action potentials, maybe you can't detect that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we, we can't. I mean, place cell firing is usually drives burst, burst firing of action potentials. And that, that's why it's... Uh, it's somewhat advantageous to use the calcium indicators, but but you're right. I mean, it's it, it is possible that if we use a much more sensitive calcium indicator than GCAM 6F, uh, we would begin to see some differences from what we actually recorded because we have a, it's a filter, right? We're I'm sure we're not detecting any single action potentials, and maybe some of the doublets were not. Uh, to to actually know, you'd have to do recordings at the same time. And I don't think anyone has done that with the mini scope. Um, I personally have done it with, with uh, in with the two photon, but no one's been able to do, do that. Uh, but you know, does that change? Does the burst firing change um, in the epileptic animal such that you maybe you're below threshold or something like that? I mean, it's a possibility, but I I sort of don't think so. Just because place fields are pretty robust robustly okay. activated. That makes sense. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Ethan. No <laughs> Without, I think uh, you should force Ethan to tell his joke in person so that... Uh, <laughs> yeah, Ethan, Ethan was sniping from the side and lots of jokes. So. <laughs> Yeah, you should require you should require a, a password for registration to keep the riffraff out of your meeting. <laughs> So, so, so Payman, there's another question, which is, what do you think is the mechanism leading leading to afferent desynchronization? Yeah, um, I'm not final cortex and uh, abnormal firing of the entorhinal cortex, and that's something that can be can be assessed by specifically inactivating or specifically altering the entorhinal cortex. That's my that's my theory, but um, it also may be that the, the incoming theta uh, oscillations are are much weaker. And we know that, and that that may be because of uh, altered inputs from the septum. That that's another possibility. I mean, the, the pilocarpine model has been criticized because it causes quite a lot of extra hippocampal damage. I'm just wondering how, how specific um, this, the, 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 these changes are to the pilocarpine model. In fact, that's, I think, one of the other questions that's come up. Yeah, that, that is to be assessed. Uh, I, I mean, we didn't want to use a focal k model because that does a huge amount of damage to the specific hippocampus where you inject it. I mean, that a lot of those i mean one is that they're having seizures really a lot like tons and tons of seizures and uh and the if you histologically you look at that hippocampus it's like a bomb went off um so that that's why we didn't use a focal model but it is possible we'd like to use genetic models of epilepsy and see whether we see the same things we're, we're going to try some models where there's um 
epilepsy and a neurodevelopmental disorder to see whether whether these things are actually common findings. Um, so we, we'll be assessing that. Um, I also like to look at data from humans at some point, but we haven't had a chance. We have we have other two questions actually. One uh, is from from Felix Chan that that asks to follow up on Ethan questions, perhaps using an audiogenic model of seizures to use the seizure using audio triggering may allow for live imaging of the cells before and after seizure. Yeah, we were we were trying to focus on temporal of epilepsy. Um, but uh, yeah, there's uh, many different ways of doing it. I mean, you can induce seizures, but we were trying to focus on temporal lobe. Yeah. yeah, then the second question is a bit what you already replied, but it's, it's one question that intrigues me when working with this model is how much an alteration serve in a particular model is specific to the model, and how much this answer can inform the understanding of epilepsy in humans. Different models, pilocarpic kinase, can produce different changes in brain dynamics. How approach this limitation and what do you think about the model limitation regarding the data that you presented? Yeah, um, I mean, that, it's true there are there are extra hippocampal damages in, in the pilocarpi model, but the damage is not necessarily from the pilocarpi itself, from, from status. I can tell you. We see patients in the hospital that have that undergo status and are seizing for days, and a lot of them aren't the same afterwards. So I can say that you know it, it does have some human applicability uh, in that sense. Um, now there's other models, and we can definitely look at those, including head trauma models. A lot of those models don't have very frequent seizures a lot of animals don't even develop epilepsy so there's I, I think you'd have to look in different models and see if you see a convergence of the evidence so that you would see these kinds of things okay thank you and i think that we don't have any any other question so, and thank you thank you again and uh that is absolutely terrific fascinating talk and uh uh, I hope the audience um, appreciated uh, Payman's efforts and think it's a worthwhile exercise that we're going to continue this every, or as, as Gabriel said, twice a month. Next talk is on the 19th of August, same time, by Dr. Alfreda gonzalez Sulzer from the University of Edinburgh uh, on medial septal gabaergic neurons reduce seizure, du seizure durations upon wireless optogenetic closed loop stimulation in the intrahippocampal canate mouse model of temporal lobe epilepsy. See you all there. <laughs> and spread the word. And thanks Thank again, Payman. Thanks, Payman. Thank you. Bye.